Welcome back to the Tax Advisor and Biz Coach Success Podcast. The purpose of these episodes is to help entrepreneurs become more successful, avoid tax and other business headaches. Remember to tune in frequently as we will be sharing tips, secrets, and expert recommendations in how you can manage your finances, improve wealth, and grow your business. Please like, share, and subscribe. Here's your host, Liz Soria. Hello, folks. This is your host, Liz Soria, the Tax Advisor and Business Coach Success Podcast. Today, I have a really, really um, special guest um, by the name of Kerry Lutz. Um, he's actually by trade. He is an attorney. Is that correct, Kerry? Welcome to the show. Yeah, recovering attorney, Liz. Recovering attorney. Okay, excellent. Uh, but more of what he has is true passion for podcasting. So today, we're going to have a wonderful talk about how to grow your audience and especially how to monetize it afterwards because if you don't have an audience well no one's going to be interested in advertising in your podcast so carrie carrie welcome and thank you for taking the time to be here with us and um uh please allow the audience to understand a little bit more about your background how long you've been doing podcasting and especially uh what is the type of audience that you have Okay, I started podcasting full-time in June of 2011. I had been dabbling in podcasting because I was doing uh, several terrestrial radio shows and posting the, uh, the recording that the studio provided me with as a podcast, just using GarageBand. Okay. And, and then, um, you know, this was in early 2011, so I guess I've really been podcasting we're like closer to eight years when you consider that, but I don't consider it really because I wasn't a professional podcaster. So <laughs> I realized that there was a lot that I didn't know about podcasting uh, from the technical standpoint, as well as radio techniques, communication techniques. So I did a Google search. I found the podcast answer man, Cliff Ravenscraft, who subsequently became a really good friend. Okay. Took his course. Took his course podcasting from A to Z. And at the time, I was getting like a couple hundred downloads a month. After taking Cliff's course, it went up to thousands. And wow. it just kept going up and up from there to there. And as Cliff always said, his theory is you build your engagement one listener at a time. You know, I agree with that, but you want to do one listener times a thousand at a time. <laughs> I like that one. I agree with that one. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's the same thing because each listener, you, you basically bring on uh, one at a time, but why not bring on a thousand ones at a time? So, uh, and Cliff was really great. I learned all of the technical aspects of podcasting. As he used to say, and he probably still says it today, is high production values will not get people to listen to your podcast, but they will get them to come back. And he had resources there for intros and outros and setting up your WordPress website, which I contracted that part out. Um, he had equipment packages. I don't think he sells equipment anymore, but I bought one of his packages, which was really good, really helped. Uh, you know, uh, and then, you know, there were things like, do you use a mixer or do you not use a mixer? Right. And I opted to use a mixer because I want more control over the quality of my show. And then, you know, he, he wrote a lot. He did a lot of things. He never wrote a book, but his course was really valuable. And it's double the price now. It's still worth it for the beginning podcaster because whether or not you succeed in podcasting really has nothing to do with equipment, has nothing to do with the technical aspects of the show. Uh, you need to master them. But once mastered, then the real work begins. And that's audience engagement. That is building an audience, uh, connecting with people, generating interest. Like Cliff was a, a genius at that. He would go to boards, anything dealing with podcasting, and he would answer questions. And he was just out there. And he built his community up. And, you know, that is one way of doing it. But for him, his business model was, hey, I'm going to do podcasting. He started out doing a podcasting called, 
you know, on the show, TV show Lost. And then from there, he was getting 30,000 downloads a week just on a fan show. And he decided he wanted, he wanted to do this uh, full time. And then he became an expert and a consultant and he would sell product. Now he's like a professional paid speaker going all over the world talking about this stuff. And it's branched out for many more opportunities for him. So he was the first person I saw do that. But his model was, I'm a consultant. I have a platform here. I will teach you how to podcast. So it was what I would call like brand extension. I mean, he created the business from his podcast. But Unbelievable, but it, right? Yeah, yeah, he was selling his service, his podcast consulting service, and selling equipment. And he even got some sponsorships. My model was I wanted to do a show where sponsors paid me money to promote their whatever. And advertising supported by far the hardest one. The right. easiest model is you got an existing business and you set up a podcast to brand extension. So you're an expert, authoritative marketing, I think Pat Flynn calls it. So you become the expert. And look, I have a chapter in the book, which I should hold up. So you yes, see please it. do. And it was the title, Viral Podcasting, right? And yeah, it's viral available viral. In, in Amazon? Yeah. Amazon, yeah. Viral prod Podcasting, a proven process to earn a six-figure income. And, you know, there's lots of really good stuff in it because it kind of traces my own journey. It's not a puff piece. It's not me tooting my own horn. It's saying, hey, I made mistakes. If you pay yeah. attention you can avoid making them and you can avoid making them too. learn from my lessons. And so we talk about business models. So by far the best podcast business model got a client, uh, Jess McPhee, they're an insurance and they're really good at it. And they started a podcast and they've got like a nice core following. I'm helping him broaden his audience, get it more out there. So, so the thing is, like I have a chapter in there. If you build it, they won't come. Okay, just because you throw your podcast up there, you're all excited. You got your podcast square done. You right. put it up there on iTunes. Your RSS feed is feeding. You're on multiple platforms. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you think this is, it's just going to take off. And then reality strikes is like, yeah, you're getting 10 downloads a week. If you're lucky. Probably, yeah, if and that's <laughs> and, and half of them are from competitors right. and the other half are from your, your friends and family who think you're insane to be doing this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you're basically, you're basically nowhere. So there's a book. Um, I hired a radio coach because my feeling is you're starting something in midlife, a new profession, whatever. You don't really know what you're doing. You need help. Absolutely. Okay? People think, well, you know, I listen to these guys on the radio and I can talk so I can do what they do. But what you don't realize when you are starting out is there's real communication techniques, engagement techniques that, that enable you to build audience and build market share. And, you know, Valerie Geller wrote a book called Beyond Powerful Radio and then um, she wrote another book that kind of extended that book to deal with podcasting and other platforms, YouTube, et cetera. She'd been a leading radio consultant, goes all over the world teaching, you know, whether it's Croatians or Albanians, teaching them how to do talk radio properly. And, and many of the conservative talk show hosts that you hear on the radio today, she mentored and the uh, some of the biggest names out there. So she understands this medium. And I remember going to her place in the uh, Upper West Side of Manhattan, bringing a couple of recordings and said, hey, Valerie, you know, like, I want to know, you give me your unbiased, unvarnished opinion. Should I give up my day job here? <laughs> and what I, was her opinion, I, Carrie? <laughs> as you said, I wasn't sure at first, but then I heard you do some storytelling and you were good. And that's the thing. Uh, I have a good friend, very successful in radio. His name's Wayne Allen Root. And his thing is facts tell, stories sell. All we have in this medium are our stories. And the ones that are the most successful, like I'm not a real fan of NPR because I don't believe in taxpayer subsidized podcasting. Right. Which 
you know, hey, if, if you gave me 2000 to $5,000 a podcast episode, man, like, forget it. It would be a work of art. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but one thing NPR knows about radio and they know about podcasting is storytelling. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's just the thing. Once upon a time, there was a company that sold widgets and they made better widgets than anyone else in the world, but they weren't doing well. They couldn't figure out no, why nobody would beat a path to their door because they were selling a better mousetrap. And then, you know, this happened. It's just storytelling 101. The better you get at storytelling, the more comfortable you are with storytelling, the better your show is going to be. And so Valerie has like 10 rules. Unfortunately, I am moving right now. So I don't have the card in front of me. Well, hold on one second. Just sure. get it. Let's get those uh, 10 tips that we can help the audience. Okay. And Carrie, real quick before you start, um, uh, with the 10, that's the one that goes powerful communication principles. I like it. So go ahead. Now, going back, before we go into that, you said you started in 2011. So, and I do appreciate all the tips and, and, and things that you have mentioned so far. Um, what is your podcast about? Because we haven't discussed that. that. I think that's really important for the audience. Well, after the financial crash and all the lying that the government was doing, the economy is fine and all this, I wanted to provide a pure source of information, what was really going on in the markets okay. to people out there, to Joe's six pack, as well as upper middle class who really had their savings negatively impacted. Well, we all know that a lot of us, don't we? <laughs> houses, you know, foreclosures, all of this. And my background as an attorney is also a, econ major in in uh, Pace University. Unfortunately, their econ department, uh, we just didn't see eye to eye, so okay. I abandoned that. And, uh, and I had been listening to other podcasts, and eventually every aspiring podcaster says, how hard can it be to do a podcast? <laughs> and the initial response is, hey, it's a little difficult. You've got to master about 20 steps to be proficient at podcasting just to record a show and post it. And, you know, you get your intro, your outro, which I just use an intro outro because I'll assume that very few people actually listen to the bitter end of a podcast. But I agree. You know, <laughs> That's the but, truth. <laughs> but just in case on the offhanded chance that somebody does, you got to have something there. Hey, the engagement measures on blog talk tell you a lot about that. So, you know, I, was in this situation uh, financially. I was well off. I didn't need to make any money off the podcast. I figured for five years, right. and I could just do what I loved. And I always had a desire to be on the radio. I did terrestrial radio shows a number of times, and I was guesting on shows. Loved doing it. And I said, "This is what I want to do." And doing a podcast sure as heck beats buying a radio station, which was the only way I could guarantee myself a permanent spot on the uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm listening to these other podcasts, Cliff's podcast. I listen to half a dozen, maybe a dozen, and I keep finding other ones. And, and me you know, too, because that's how we learn from others. Honestly, if I'm from learning from others who have been doing it way longer than us. And uh, I'm a newbie, uh, as I call myself in the block, I've been doing my podcast maybe for a year and a half now. And I got a lot to learn. So I'm excited that you're here in the show and sharing so many tips because one of the things you're right, um, at the beginning, we kind of just, you know, experimenting. Uh, and we're not, we, this is not our profession, like you said. So this is something yeah. that like anything else, you need to learn the skills. And the more you do it, I, I do believe that, you know, exercise and practice makes you better. So I think that's, you know, really important. Yeah. So I had a, a radio show on, talking about real estate, which I didn't really want to talk about, but it was on once a week. It okay. was a paper play show. I said, I'm going to do what I really want to do, which is talk financial stuff, alternative investing, what's really happening in the economy. And, you know, that was when I started to boom, uh, when I really talked about what I was passionate about. And just amazing things happened from that point on. And I knew this was a calling. And that's the way you have to view this is, you have to treat your podcast as a business from day one, but it is a calling. And if you're not called to do it, don't do it because 
It's a lot of work. And yeah, I was doing my radio show once a week for an hour and I sucked at it, frankly. And then <laughs> after, um, after doing it, I said, if I want to get good at this, I really have to do it all the time because, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, Gadsden, I can't remember his, Ma- Malcolm, uh, whatever his name is, Gladstone, Gladstone uh, said you need 10,000 hours to become an expert in any given field. But if you've already been an expert in other fields, you don't need that much. You only need a couple thousand. So I started doing like seven segments a day or no, four segments a day, seven days a week. Wow. I mean, literally was working every single day doing this. I didn't have anything else to do. And I had <laughs> Good for you, Carrie. <laughs> I had nothing better. And, you know, then it just became very natural. natural. It became, uh, you know, I get better and better. And then I would have air checks. Like one thing you podcasters don't do that you need to do is air check. You need somebody to listen to your show and says, you know, you could have said this better. You could have done this better. Not to tear you apart, but to help, you know, give you constructive criticism so that you will improve the quality and the caliber of your show. Right. And when you do that, uh, every time you get air checked, even now, like seven years later, I'll have Valerie air check me. And, you know, I learn things and I progress because until you're like at the best at the top of your game where you're perfect and you can't improve, you can always improve. Even the masters of talk radio do. So the powerful communication principles, it's in the back of the book. Valerie let me reprint certain things from her book. So speak visually in terms a listener can picture. So rather than say, you know, they hopped in a car and drove. It was a sweltering 90 degree day. They went into the car, you know, in a red car, uh, blasted the air conditioning, whatever. You know, give visual cues for the, uh, for the story that you're telling. Start with your best material. I don't know about that. I think all my material is my best, but seriously, story tell powerfully. Never let anything go too long. Listen. So when you're interviewing somebody, make sure you're listening to what they have to say. And always think, why would someone want to hear this? Uh, address each listener. Address each listener as in an individual, you. Use the term you. Don't say oh, listeners out there should go do this, say, you should go do it. This is something will, that will help you. Not this is something that might help uh, some people. You know, personalize your show. That is a key thing. The most powerful word in radio is you. Um, do engaging transitions and handoffs. Uh, to promote, you know, brag about your stuff. And brag about other people. If you borrow stuff from other people, perfectly, perfectly acceptable. Give credit where credit is due. I uh, give you 100% on that one, Carrie. And you've done that since the beginning of, of the actual episode. I mean, you give a lot of credit to people that you learned because it's nice to share not only what we have learned from others, it's not about us only sharing our own experience, but what others have done a contribution to our success. And yeah. I want to talk something real quick, um, because I think what's really important is, um, at least with my audience, it's, it's more about you know small entrepreneurs and people who are in different niches. But you mentioned something that I think I want to kind of retouch on that is the fact that Maybe you can start just with a very basic podcast. Like you said, maybe something promoting your business, something that you can talk about things that you can share your skills and your experience that can help that type of audience. So in other words, instead of being just broad and just trying to cover everyone, just finding that niche, which I think in any type of business that you do, period. Yeah, well, you need to think who in the right mind would want to listen to this show. <laughs> Who is that group? There's some group out there. Somebody's going to listen to me. Who is it? Is it, uh, and that's why I say, know your market. So Mm -hmm. some people will want to, want to connect with millions of listeners. So they'll do millennials living in their parents' basement or attic. Okay. Others will say, I only want to go for the money. I want people who own private jets and Mm -hmm. Hey, 
if you get a million millennials who are broke or you get a hundred private aircraft owners, who's, who's a better market to monetize? I, I think we can do the math. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we know the right. answer to that. Yeah, because, you know, people who own their own private planes are generally, you know, eight figures. Yeah. So we look at that. So who is going to, what, what is their age? What is your archetype listener? They call them, uh, what do they call them? They call them something that I can't stand the term, so I've forgotten about it. All right. But, uh, you know, fair enough. Your avatar, your avatar. Avatar, so, yes, sir. It's a really stupid term. <laughs> and you know, this reminds me of the movie Avatar. So it's like, no, Avatar is a cartoonish, it's like an emoji. It doesn't yeah. exist. Your listener audience potential exists. They are real people. They are not <laughs> avatars. So you look at that, and then you say, can I make a living off of this? And you're never ever really going to come up with a answer, but you need to do some rudimentary business plan. How much is this going to cost me to do? In most cases, not very much, assuming uh, you do most of the work yourself. You don't contract out much, you know, thousand dollars a month, no problem. And that's probably on the high side. You need to invest another thousand bucks on equipment and, wow. You know, you don't even have to invest that. But my feeling is you need some skin in the game. You need something that's going to hold your attention because it's not all straight up. It's right. it, uh, fits and starts. It's ebbs and flows. So the more skin in the game you have, and then the most important investment is your time because there's an opportunity cost. Yeah. So so that's, that's what we kind of look at. And then, you know, uh, don't pander to your audience but figure out what your audience wants to hear and give it to them in a way that you can be authentic. Authenticity is crucial, right? Always be yourself. Uh, that's, that's one of uh, Valerie's rules. And, you know, take risks, be who you are, be true to yourself, stay right. curious, right? And, and then allow humor to happen. You know, you shouldn't start out trying to be funny because humor can be dangerous. But if you're spontaneously funny, that's good. And all humor, to some extent, is situational. And let that build over time. The other thing like I like to do in the morning sometime is just watch comedians. Watch them be on The Tonight Show, Jay Leno, Rodney Dangerfield, great comedians. Mm -hmm. And that will put you in a positive state. And then when you go do your show, the humor will just come to you. It's an amazing thing. And... You know, you, the jokes just come, but to try to do stand up yourself, unless you are a comedian, probably don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't, because it's just not going to work out. But, Carrie, I'm sorry to interrupt there for a moment. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to actually ask you, like, it, it would be probably the audience if they, they could do it, um, it's how important is. Uh, when we talk about matrix of, of downloading episodes, is that a valid thing that needs to be continued done if you want to start doing sponsorships or others, you know, being interested in your podcast? Is that really important? Because the reason why I bring this up because um, I've seen a lot of things that people now streaming, meaning that they're not really downloading; they're just streaming live. So can yeah. you can you measure that because there's well, a big difference what was like five years ago versus to now which we recorded this in 2018 please Karen so two different mediums streaming live is not podcasting okay? okay because the whole point of podcasting is an episode gets uploaded to an RSS feed you download that episode and you can listen to it at your convenience when you feel like it so there's two separate concepts now. All right. <laughs> If streaming works for you, that's great, but I'm very skeptical of Facebook's analytics and YouTube's analytics for how many people are really listening live. Okay. But understand that if you're building a live audience, that's not a podcast audience. Okay, it doesn't mean you can't do live segments, right. but that's not podcasting. That is uh, media streaming, you know, that's live streaming, totally different. And that could very well be part of your marketing uh, structure, you know, your marketing plan is to do both, and that's fine. I mean, I do pod, I do uh, webinars for clients. You know, they pay me money to put these webinars on, and uh, we get hundreds of people watching them, and that's all well and good. So, whatever your marketing plan is, just stick to it, 
but the concept of live streaming, no. But one thing that you can stream, like I put my, most of my listeners come to my website and then they click episodes and they listen on the website. So <laughs> to me, that's a much more engaged thing than somebody clicked subscribe eight years ago <laughs> and still downloading the episodes now, but they never listen to it, which <laughs> is a big portion of it. Okay. And I do the same thing, by the way. I do recommend the same thing. If you are, you know, in a consistent basis, right, you're doing a podcast, make sure you put it in your website too because a lot of your customers or your clients that are going to come to your website. They're not going to really look for you out in a, a podcast or, you know, channel, YouTube, uh, I'm sorry, iTunes or SoundCloud or any other ones. They're going to come to your website. That's, you know, how they connect with you. So that's really, really important. So downloading definitely, it, it's still crucial when it comes to, uh, people who are, who, who are listening and, and, and they're interested in, like you said, of expanding their podcast, maybe they're ready. Let's talk about consistency, right? Because that's really important podcast. And what do you recommend someone in the middle of the road? In other words, they maybe are over a year, they have a few podcasts, they've done interviews with experts also, they're adding all that value. What do you think? Okay. If you're not going to do at least a weekly podcast, don't bother. Because wow. the human brain is programmed for weekly. You could do daily if you want. If you have enough material and you do it, fine. That's what I do. I do it daily. I do 10 segments a week to 12. Uh, but if you're not going to do it da uh, weekly, don't do it. Because, oh. you know, why are television shows weekly? And then when they skip a week, it drives you nuts. It does. Uh, you're right. Before, uh, before we had, you know, entities releasing all their episodes at once to be binged watch. Um, <clears throat> Everybody was a weekly viewer. Uh, yeah, there's some TV shows that are nightly or daily, but uh, you know, not the uh, not the programming, the power programming of the networks. Yeah, like uh, Oprah's on every day, and the news is on every day, and all that. But you know, what we're talking about are creative shows. So, the point is weekly or don't bother, and. When you go on, when you release your show, release at least eight episodes at once. Because that uh, way, if somebody downloads it, they download one, they'll subscribe, they'll automatically get eight downloads instead of one. So, and they might listen to the eight downloads. So I don't release any new podcast. I tell people, do not release unless you have at least eight episodes. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I made that mistake. So I, I would imagine if I did that mistake, maybe a lot of newbies have too. I started my podcast and I only recorded, I think it was like two episodes. And I thought, oh, not a big deal. I'm just going to, you know, publish this one and then I wait a month <laughs> and I publish the second yeah. one. So that, that's a good thing that you're bringing up, especially again for the newbies and people who are just coming on board. Make sure that you have at least a few episodes recorded mm -hmm. and again, specializing on, 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 your, on your niche. Um, so consistency is definitely a, a big plus once, let like yeah. say, minimum once a week. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, you're going to learn. It's a learning process. It's a journey. And, you know, then when you get ready, uh, Cliff Ravenscraft always said, put off monetization as long as you possibly can. Now that's not realistic for most of you out there. You're going to want to be monetizing from day one, but you got to have something there to show your advertisers one of the things I mentioned is the spokesman model of podcasting where, Hey, I'm a, I'm a skier, outdoor enthusiast. I use products and I contact those places say, Hey, I'm your guy here. I'm, you know, I use your skis only been using them since I'm 16 and see if you can get them that way. But, you know, as far as uh, your uh, monetization goes, you, you can look at, things that are outside your market because people who ski have higher disposable income more likely to travel so travel sponsors could very well be uh, a good uh, horizontal expansion of your market and then it's also multiple streams of income you use website you use you build a mailing list building a mailing list essential have to do that um so some people are better at that than I am. I've got like 12, 15,000 email addresses since I've been doing it and building the list that is still the most profitable means of internet marketing is email marketing. 
and don't let anybody tell you it isn't. Yes, you can make money at webinars. Yes, you can do this. One of the things I love about webinars is if I market them properly, I will wind up getting like 500 to 1,000 new email addresses in one clip. That wow. is a great thing. That is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let's go back before we wrap up the episode, by the way, Karen, because you did uh, show, uh, for those who are actually watching our episode, because we do also the video format, um, show those 10 success steps of uh, the one that you were recommending because we didn't win yeah. through those. Yeah. So, yeah, the 10 steps, you know, I think we pretty much covered them. They're in the book here in viral podcasting they're in the end uh, valerie uh, graciously let me uh put them in there and we've we've put we've helped many people go from literally having no audience whatsoever to going to the top of itunes itunes not as important as it once was but still 62 percent of traffic roughly according to rob walsh of libsyn emanates from um from iTunes compared to the other aggregators, but there's a lot of ways to get your message out there and get people to click your link. So uh, don't be constrained by iTunes, but obviously if you put up a show on iTunes and it goes to hot, hot shows, you know, hot podcasts, and you're up there right away, number one, you need 16,000 downloads a day for a period of time and a couple hundred you could get 10 or 20 reviews or a couple hundred as long as they're positive, but 16,000 downloads a day will get you to the top of iTunes business and maybe even the top of iTunes. But when you do these meteoric rises, there's a lot of people nipping at your heels and they start giving you nasty reviews and they, oh, no. they get you take, you know, they knock you down. iTunes, your strategy to get on iTunes should be initially to hit there as hard as you can and then promote your show through other platforms because there are other platforms, you know, iTunes 62%, that's at least 38% of other aggregators, podcast aggregators. And when you're talking about 100, 200 million listeners worldwide, 38% of 100 million is still 38 million listeners. I'd rather get 1% uh, of that than a tenth of a percent of the 62 million that are on uh, iTunes. And I, I don't know the exact number. It could be more, it could be less. There's bad analytics on podcasts, but somewhere up to 100 million people a year will listen to one or more podcasts. I think that's a fair assumption. And, uh, and that's just in the US. So, you know, you follow your heart, you follow your passion, you use sound business techniques, strategies for building your business like building your email list. And you use multiple channels so you get multiple sources of income, understanding that oftentimes, unless you're a spokesman, your sponsors are gonna burn out in three to six months. They will get maximum penetration. I mean, I was with Audible books for like a year, and then one day they said, uh, you know, like we don't get enough from you anymore. You could just be an affiliate. Affiliates good if they pay money if they actually pay a lot of them are scammy I'm not a big fan of uh, a lot of them But if you get a good affiliate marketing relationship like my good friend Jordan Goodman moneyanswers.com right. he, He's earning over six figures Just on affiliate marketing because Is that right. Oh yeah. my god. I didn't never thought that you could make that much in affiliation <laughs> He used to write for Money Magazine, so he's well-known. He's not a celeb, but he's well-known. And the beauty is that uh, a lot of these affiliates that he's got are huge dollar sales, and he could get ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 per sale per commission, and he does a number of these. You know, I'm not counting his money. He's never shared with me how much he makes, but he does very well. He's written a lot of books as well. Hey, that's the other thing. Write your book. You have a book in you and get it out there because the number of podcasters with books versus the number of podcasters without books, like Cliff Ravenscraft doesn't have a book yet and he knows he needs one. It's easy to do. You could hire somebody to do it for you. Sure. Or you could just buy an existing book, but I don't believe in that. Authenticity is key and don't make it garbage. Make it good. 
You know, I know there's mistakes in my book, typos, hyphenations that are incorrect. But you know what? In the final analysis, I did a good job writing it. I got a professional editor and it reads well and it's actionable information. And hey, if you want to talk to me, want me to listen to your podcast, give you advice, consult for you, I'm available. The email address is kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com, viralpodcasting.com, the website. And it's easy, you know. There's a lot of easy steps that you can take today to build your show up, to eventually turn it into a money generator. But you know, Liz, from your experience, this is not a get-rich-quick uh, scheme. No, it's not. It it's not. That way. Be patient. Enjoy the journey. It's all the journey. It's not the destination. And follow your heart, and you can't help but succeed. Thank you so much, Carrie. And you know what? I, I, I have to say that I, I agree with you, too, because – uh, my, my nature, my business obviously is crunching numbers and doing tax advisory for my clients. But I tell you, when I started my podcast, it's because it's a way that I felt that it was kind of like a passion also to me where I felt like I needed to share this information. And um, I just started like maybe a little bit over six months ago, bringing experts like yourself, you know, to my show. And the reason for it, because even though I can talk a lot about things about how to save you money and, you know, all these things, it's nice to bring other professionals that they can share, you know, other things that can really bring, um, you know, motivation, right? And I think that's part of why the name of my podcast is, you know, uh, the Best Coach Success Podcast because it's success. You've been successful doing what you're doing right now. And a lot of people who are thinking, is it really possible, you know, to, to monetize? Is it really true that I can make this into, a, you know, an income besides what I'm working? Um, and again, like you said, it's passion, it's patience, and especially I have to say this, and I have mentioned it in other episodes, please, people, we need, we really, really need to get coaching. We need people who are experts in what they do because, you know what, it's just going to cut corners for you. It's going to make you get there a little faster, smooth ride. So isn't that right, Carrie? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I learned how to ski when I was 25 years old. That's <laughs> old to learn how to ski. And I'll tell you, I was never a great skier. Uh, but I wasn't a peril to the mountain either. And the way I did it, my wife said, if you're going to learn this, you need private lessons. You pay the money, you take 20 private lessons, and you will become an adequate, uh, competent skier. You know, you're not going to go uh, win any uh, championships. You're not going to be in the Olympics, but you're not going to humiliate yourself either. And this is equally true unless you've got a media background, you've been in television, and television's totally different than radio. Uh, most television stars that start podcasts or start radio shows generally fail because they don't understand the difference. Radio is a whole nother thing. When it's done properly, it's magical. It's transformative and it's bonding. These people look to you, they look up to you, they connect with you on a very intimate, personal level. Did you? When it's done incorrectly, they just turn the dial, they click the button, goodbye. And one last note I like to kind of end up with, with this episode, especially while you're still here, Kara, is the fact that, like I said, my podcast, I started converting into video for the YouTube, you know, uh, subscribers that I have. But when I look at the analytic reports, I mean, it's incredible how my podcast is growing way faster. That's the truth. Um, versus to how my YouTube channel is. And it's because I think somehow... Uh, yes, it is easier, obviously, we, we don't need to go into those details. People can listen to something while they're multitasking. So that does make it a lot easier for them to listen to, you know, to, to the show. Um, but it's just, I feel like there's more loyalty. People are more faithful to oh, a yeah. podcast, like a radio channel versus to a, you know, a, a, a video or, you know, a TV channel. You know, you, you need to be on YouTube. And uh, even if you're not doing video, you can just use various uh, servers to post automatically to YouTube. That's what I do. I do video once in a while when I feel like it, but I'm moving now, setting up a new studio. I'm going to do it a lot more. But the point is that, uh, that YouTube people listen a lot less than podcasts. They will cut you off. Um, you know, like I could do YouTubes in the car, it goes through and I don't watch the video, but generally podcasts 
it's different age group for the most part, a different market completely, which is why you need to be on YouTube. But don't expect, even if you get great numbers on YouTube, that they mean anything. And don't forget, YouTube's unstable platform. You say something they don't like, they kick you off now. So oh. we're, YouTube is going to be marginalized and they're killing their brand now. Ultra politicization. They should just be carriers. They shouldn't pass judgment on content as long as you're not threatening to blow plate people up or kill people. You know, and hey, if you profanity, it's like you choose whether or not you're going to watch it. Right. Uh, generally, I don't think I've ever cursed on my show. I don't think you need to. I think most profanity is gratuitous right. and doesn't really add anything to your message and will turn off a certain portion of the population. And that's right. enough. Mm -hmm. Unless you some, some I like it. Some I like it. Again, it's, it's the kid, it depends on your audience. So if that's their style, then that's where you deliver what they like, what they want. But Carrie, thank you so much. I mean, you know, not only you have shared with us so many, uh, you know, Phenomenal tips. I mean, in how to not only grow an audience, um, how to be able to really, um, I guess, stick to the plan. I mean, these are plans and goals that we have to create. And like you say, consistency is definitely uh, you know something that's crucial uh, to be able to expand you know your your channel um, and constantly giving good good you know information out there. People are really looking for this. Um, and I want to thank you so much. Anything else that before we wrap up? Uh, again, your contact information, please. Um, and again, your book. Okay, so the book is Viral Podcasting and a proven process to earn a six-figure income from your show. Site is viralpodcasting.com. Email me. I'll glad to gladly do a complimentary air check of your show portion of it. Let you know how it sounds to me. Uh, I'm not the be all and the end all, but I'll give you an idea of uh, of how powerful your communication techniques are, how effective they are. K L at Kerry K E R R Y Lutz L U T Z dot com. Just shoot me an email and uh, let's talk, and maybe we can work together. Thank you so much once again, Carrie. Car it's been a pleasure to have you in our show, and hopefully, I might have you for another episode. You got so much to learn from that uh, we might need your help again very soon. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And to every one of my folks out there, thank you for listening because I know you have a lot of choices out there and I appreciate that. And uh, just stay tuned uh, as we continue doing other interviews and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Carrie. Bye-bye, everyone.